and I am so obsessed. Ooh, sorry, I just kicked the camera. And she winds up getting swept off her feet by this fabulous rich man. Mixer, 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 mixer. So reluctantly, they return to the island, although they've never been there in the first place. And this was definitely the most horror-y of them all. So, or his home called Manderley. Oh my God, why can't I talk about this book? Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse. It's been a minute or two since I have filmed a video and all's fine, but like everybody, you know, life. Uh, life is kind of crazy, work is kind of crazy, and I'm kind of crazy, and I just have not had sort of the bandwidth or the energy or just all the things to drop in front of a camera. So apologies for the delayed April wrap up and the giant gap in videos. It's been a couple of weeks, but I'm trying to play some catch up here. And I thought we would start with what I read in the month of April, because even though I haven't been here, I have been reading and I have been trying to do updates on my Instagram. So if you guys follow me there, you know that I am out and about, by which I mean walking around the neighborhood. <laughs> That's about it. But I read a whole bunch of really good books this month and I'm really excited to talk about them. So let's just dive in. So the first book I finished is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier and I actually lent it to my mom so I don't have it with me right now. But if you have been following me then I went on about this during my five star prediction wrap up video so I will link that for you. But long story short I loved this book and it was my first time reading it. Classic, classic, classic. I was starting to grow really embarrassed that I hadn't read it yet. And it was one of these books where I constantly heard authors reference it and like other readers reference it, but more so with authors. And this will play a part in a minute. But I feel like I have a different appreciation for so many other books now that I've read Rebecca. So Rebecca is the story of a somewhat young, somewhat naive woman who winds up getting swept off her feet by the very mysterious, like wealthy, charming, all the things who maybe he's 20 years older than her, Mr. Max de Winter, but she is all in and they have this kind of wild fast courtship and they wind up getting married and he brings her back to his home, which is this estate, Manderley. And he is recently widowed. So when he comes home with a new bride, people are a little bit, surprised but someone who has the biggest problem with it is the housekeeper Mrs. Danvers and Max's wife Rebecca died pretty recently and Mrs. Danvers was very connected to her and she is not jazzed about the fact that he has a new wife coming to the house and trying to take Rebecca's place. So this is sort of this very twisty gothic dark I said it in my review before, like this is dark and messed up people doing dark and messed up things. And I never thought I would have found it in a book from the thirties. And this book, I managed to not be spoiled for this book. I don't even know how, but I did. And so reading it was just like an absolute adventure for me and I loved it. So if you wanna hear all of my thoughts, definitely check out my five star review video. And if you haven't read it, I would highly recommend it. It's so good. And I actually did some of it on audiobook as well. And it was like great gothic spookiness to it on that side. Totally recommend it. Fabulous book. So the second book I listened to is JT Ellison's latest book, Her Dark Lies. And this is definitely Rebecca inspired. And JT Ellison talks about that when she talks about the book. So when I heard that, I was like, I absolutely want to read this next because I was so curious to see sort of where the inspiration was and where sort of the winks and the nods were. And I feel like I totally got things that I normally would not have like Easter eggs that I wouldn't have picked up on otherwise, because how would you if you hadn't read Rebecca? But JT Ellison is definitely one of my favorite authors and I love her from an author standpoint, her craft, talks, her encouragement for writers. She's a super generous writer when if you listen to podcasts with her, or interviews with her, like she's just so invested in helping other writers and I just love her. She just seems like a super cool woman and of course I'd like want to be her friend, but I also totally enjoy her books. So this was super atmospheric. This is a destination wedding off the coast of Italy. And it is one of those weddings where if it can possibly go wrong, it will. So kind of like buckle up, buddy, buckle up. 
And in this book, we get multiple points of view, multiple mysteries. And this is one of those books where I wonder if my experience would have been different if I read it. And I don't know if it would have been different for better or for worse, but this is one of those books where I feel like you're intentionally kept a little bit off kilter and it's by design rather than a book that like just doesn't make sense if that makes sense. So in this book, we follow Claire Hunter, who is kind of this bohemian up and coming artist from Nashville. And she meets the super wealthy, super good looking, super charming Jack Compton. And he is one of the children of this kind of like uber rich family. And JT Ellison describes them as like Bill Gates level rich. And like they own the island off of Italy that they're getting married on. And in this book, Jack, much like in Rebecca, his first wife has passed away under kind of mysterious circumstances, but Claire's not too put by it. It happened 10 years ago and she's just, you know, she's in love. She wants to get married. She's excited for her new life. And there's kind of been some things. And then they get to the island and there's kind of some weird stuff happening and not everything quite connects. And there's a, cute, a couple odd occurrences and there's a couple spooky occurrences. And it basically is worst destination wedding ever. But this is one of those books where you just have no idea what's around the next corner. You don't know who to trust. There's so many games and manipulations and kind of very twisty turny. And it was one of those books where like, there's a lot of unlikable people in it, but you know, I like me an unlikable person. So here's like my question of like, would it have been different if I was reading it? Because we get multiple points of view, but on the audiobook we have one single narrator. So when we were switching narration points on the book, I didn't always know it was somebody else talking until it started, like things started to happen in the chapter. And I'd be like, oh wait, we're not Claire anymore. We're somebody else. And again, I think it was by design. So we're not quite supposed to know who's talking at certain points, if that makes sense. So I feel like it added to the twisty turniness of it. So I very much enjoyed it. I think coming off the heels of Rebecca, I had a good time with it. This was definitely not the most blow me out of the water thriller, but it was like thoroughly enjoyable thriller. Like I needed to know what was happening next. And there was a little bit of kind of like that ridiculousness, but at the same time I was like here for the ridiculousness. If you like, kind of how I feel when I watch Pretty Little Liars. Like you reach a point where you're just sort of like, all right, I'm gonna suspend a little bit of disbelief and have some fun here. And I had fun with this book. My only like hitch with it is a lot of the characters had very similar names and I was having a hard time remembering who was who. So there was, Hannah, Anna, and Harper. So it was like Harper, Hannah, Anna. And I was like, come on, man, give me a fighting chance. So again, I think if I was reading it, maybe it would have been different. There were moments where I had to pause and be like, wait, is this his mother? Is this Claire's sister? Like who's talking right now? There was a little bit of an adjustment with that. And I think with a huge cast of characters, cause there were probably like 12 or so characters in the like very, and then there were none type of big character list. It was a lot of people to remember. And again, when I think when you're listening to an audiobook with a lot of people to remember, it can always be a bit tricky, but don't let that be a reason not to pick it up, but I still had a good time with the book. So another book I had a really good time with was The Cousins by Karen McManus. I started reading this in March as my palate cleanser for Pet Cemetery, My like, I will read this at night because Pet Cemetery is too flippin' scary to read at night. And then somewhere along the way, I just kind of got distracted by other, you know, bright and shiny things as I'm apt to do. So I finished the book in April. I had a good time with this book also. So this is another one with a super rich family who basically owns an island. But in this one, it is, kind of a fake island on Cape Cod. So it's sort of Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and then there is the island that the Story family owns. So that's their last name is Story, S-T-O-R-Y. So wink, wink, nod, nod. And in this one, kind of on a twist of one of my favorite tropes of like the reluctant return home, similar to her book, Two Can Keep a Secret, we have the children who have to return to their parents' hometown and unravel some secrets that happened years ago. So this book follows Millie, Jonah, and Aubrey. Keep wanting to say Audrey. 
and their parents 20 years ago were basically ousted from their family. So they each received a letter from their mom's lawyer that says, you know what you did. Basically, I am done with you. They have been cut out of the will. They've been cut out of the family. None of them have seen or talked to their mother since. And they swear up and down. They have no idea what they did. But their mom doesn't want to see them. Their father had passed away. Their mom wanted to have nothing to do with them. So we fast forward 20 years later. They are all married, living lives, having had their kids. Their kids are seniors in high school. And they each receive a letter from their grandmother inviting them to spend the summer on her island and working at one of her resorts. And the parents are like, you're going. You were getting us back in the family. You were getting us back in the will. You were getting us back in grandma's good graces. No questions asked. You guys are going. And these three cousins, well, they had sort of met when they were younger. They don't really know each other. There's all sorts of family stuff going on here. So off they go to this island off of Cape Cod and they have to work at grandma's resort. <laughs> and pretty quickly they figure out sort of how infamous their family is and how infamous their parents were. And they also start to uncover some secrets and some things that are going on. And we get to see their perspective and their three points of view. And then we also get to see the point of view of Allison, who is the mother of one of the girls and she is the only daughter in the family. And we see her point of view from 20 years earlier as we try and figure out exactly what her and her brothers did to get them axed from the family. So this was like just, again, like good kind of twisty popcorny fun. There was one reveal where I was like, oh, didn't see that coming. And I very much just like enjoy being down for the ride. So I love Cape Cod. You guys know I used to live in Boston. So I love kind of all the vibes of that as well. And I just had a good time with it. So it was a good, just sort of like fun. I don't want to say like easy read because that doesn't quite sound right. But it was just after, I guess after reading some heavier books like Rebecca, which again, I thoroughly enjoyed, but it definitely was like a different paste read and like the language was different. So it definitely was like a shifting gear. So this is like a good palette cleanser after reading some heavier books, multiple points of view, reluctant return home, family secrets, mysteries in the past, mysteries in the present. It's just all the things I love. Okay. This next book was 1000%. Everybody was talking about it. And I was like, what is this book? What am I missing out on? I need to get on this train immediately. And again, if you follow me on Instagram, this is not going to be a surprise but House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland. Oh my God. Oh my God, you guys. This is a book that a thousand percent would have passed me by if people that I follow and people I see on Instagram were not reading it. And thank God it didn't pass me by. This was definitely like horror, fantasy, fairy tale, Dark and messed up people doing dark and messed up things doesn't even begin to cover this one. And it still manages to be somewhat grounded in reality of modern day London. And I just loved it. And even though there were moments, she can evoke some really wretched <laughs> descriptions of things. So horror, horror, horror. I couldn't stop reading this book and I just, I was loved it. I just absolutely loved it. I am so obsessed with this book, with this cover. How can you not be? And with her writing. So this book follows three sisters, Iris, Vivi, and Gray Hollow. And 10 years ago, they legit vanished into thin air on a street in Scotland. So they were there with their parents. It was New Year's Eve and her parents turned to each other to kiss at midnight and they turned around and their three daughters were gone. And shocker, 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 nobody really believed their parents at first. They're like, people don't just disappear into thin air. And then a month later, the three girls reappear in the exact same street where they went missing. And they're a little bit different. So they were already stunning children with their dark hair and their blue eyes but now their hair has gone white blonde and their eyes have gone black and they have absolutely no memory of what happened to them. They don't know where they were. They don't know where they went. They don't know what happened while they were there. They were gone and now they're back. 
and their parents are just thrilled to bits to have their kids back and they don't ask any questions and maybe they should have. So <laughs> we fast forward, kind of the book opens 10 years later and Iris is the youngest of the sisters and she's our narrator that we're following. So she's a senior in high school and all she wants to do is just graduate, go to college. Both of her sisters have left home. They've become famous in their own right. So her oldest sister, Gray, is a fashion designer and an influencer and she runs the House of Hollow. And then her middle sister, Vivi, is in a rock band and she just is the rebel of the group and she's touring everywhere. And Vivi is coming back to town to play a gig and the sisters are gonna get back together again to see her play. But Gray doesn't show up and Gray has gone missing. And it is up to Iris and Vivi to find their sister who has left them some breadcrumbs about what could have happened to her, which is going to lead us back to what happened all those years ago. And it is just, it, it is twisty and it is dark. And there's so many great characters in this. I just loved it. I just absolutely loved it, you guys. I, like I said, I would not have predicted I loved it so much, but like the writing is stunning. The descriptions are beautiful. I feel like there's so much, it's not like Pet Cemetery, but it's like Pet Cemetery in that it is about, it is about family, it's about grief, it's about love, it's about loss, it's about, you know, struggling with the things that you will do to save your family. And ultimately it's about the bond between these three sisters. And it's just so beautifully written and so beautifully done. And after listening to interviews and watching interviews with Crystal Sutherland and hearing her talk about this book and her passion for writing it, I just love it even more. And it's another one, I feel like lately, I'm finding the more time kind of away from a book that I am, the more I'm coming to appreciate it. And I did a couple buddy reads recently. So I did Addie LaRue with Sarah and Lindsay. And then Lindsay and I just read The House, The Last House on Needless Street. Oh, good. And then just talking about books and getting other people's perspectives on things, I feel like it's really increased my appreciation in a lot of ways. So whether it's listening to an author talk about it or listening to a friend of mine talk about it and being able to really like go deep. So more than just watching somebody's review like you're doing right now, but it's just, it was so, so good. And I can't wait to read her other books. So I know her first two books are not like as, or at all kind of horror like this, but it was interesting listening to her talk because she was saying that her first couple of books she wrote that didn't get published were more like this. And then Chemical Hearts was the first one, which I think, I don't know if it's like a love story, but it was made into an Amazon Prime movie, which I didn't know until she said it. So I'm gonna watch, I'm gonna read it and then I'm gonna watch that. And then the next one is Semi-Definitive List of Worst Nightmares, I think has a little bit of maybe fantastical elements. And then this one, she goes all in. And this is kind of the trajectory that she's on. So I can't wait to see what she does next. But if you have some curiosity about this book, I would definitely pick it up. There are definitely some like gag moments in this definitely some gag moments in this, but it's worth it. It's totally worth it. So again, if you guys follow me on Instagram, you would have already seen me talk about Mother May I by Jocelyn Jackson. And this just came out in April. So this is the arc of it. And this was another just dark and messed up people doing dark and messed up things. Mysteries in the past, mysteries in the present. And I really enjoyed this book. So you guys know, I read Never Have I Ever, God, I guess it was two years ago now. And I really enjoyed that book, but I had like a little bit of discomfort with the ending of it. But this book, I was totally like hook, line and sinker for, and I had such a fun time with it. So in this book, we follow Brie Cabot and Brie is a mom. She has two teenage daughters and then she has a newborn two, two month old son. And her husband's away on a business trip and Brie is at the school watching her children, her daughter's in a play and no sooner does she sort of turn her back and then turn back around and her son is gone and he's been kidnapped. And there is a note left in his little seat, his little car seat carrier that he was sitting in that says, you know, go home right now, call me, tell nobody if you wanna see your son alive, basically. And she is terrified and she follows the instructions and she just goes. 
and the kidnapper calls her and is like, I'll give you your kid back. You just need to do one small thing for me. Easy peasy, get it done. And of course, <laughs> it's not easy peasy. And things go super sideways and things get super dark and messed up really fast. And Brie is desperate to get her son back. And what she cannot for the life of her figure out is why this person picked her. And also the woman who has kidnapped her son is also a mother and she cannot for the life of her fathom how another mother could do this to somebody. So the kidnapper has told her, you know, don't involve the police, don't tell anyone, don't tell your husband, don't tell your kids, don't tell anyone you know, and I will give you your kid back. So Brie follows all of her instructions. She's completely freaked out. And she maybe kind of totally enlists the help of one of her best friends who used to be a cop, but now works as an investigator at the firm where her husband works. And this is like one of those jam packed over a couple of days, like ticking time bomb, rush to the finish kind of a story. And we get two points of view. It's so dark and twisty. There's so many secrets. It's hyper messed up. I was totally here for it. I really, really, really enjoyed this book. So I enjoy Jocelyn Jackson's writing. I like how she both like goes to dark and messed up places, but there's also such a humanity to the relationships with the people, the like the protective mother instinct that kicked in for Brie. And I had a really good time with this book. So I enjoyed it more than ever have I ever for sure. I was totally satisfied start to finish. And I found it to just be a great wild ride. So if you're looking for something to get lost in, I thought it was great. It's another one of these, like, see how dog-eared it is. You can tell. To me, like, you can always tell how much I love a book by how much I dog-ear it. And I totally enjoyed this one. So this was great fun. And again, I got the arc of this. So thank you, thank you again to William Morrow for sending it my way. Because it was tremendous. I was finding myself really craving dark books this month. And the last time I did one of my shelf unhauls, I pulled The Darkest Corners by Kiara Thomas off my shelf because I read on the back of it that it said, as compulsive as cereal and as dark as Gillian Flynn. And I was like, why am I not reading this book? So I read it and while it was fine, I would say I found a book that I can unhaul. And it wasn't a bad book. I read the entire thing. I was super curious to see where it was going. I was intrigued, but ultimately I just didn't love it. And it's a YA thriller and I don't know. I don't know if I've just, I mean, I dog-eared a bunch of pages in it. So like I said, that's always a good sign for me, but I felt like the payoff just wasn't enough for me. So even though I was sort of like compulsively reading it sometimes, at other points, I just felt like, almost like there was too much going on in some ways. And then this was one of those books where, cause I feel like you can see like I dog eared like pretty compulsively up to a point and then like nothing towards the end. <laughs> like I feel like the end is usually where it gets good. But this is one of those books where I feel like you couldn't have predicted a lot of stuff or figured out a lot of stuff because it was never there. So there was sort of like this whole other explanation of why that you never would have known or figured out. And I just didn't love that. I just didn't love that. And I don't like when, like, I guess I feel like it didn't play fair in that way. So that's always just a struggle for me. So this book follows Tessa and about 10 years ago, Tessa and her best friend at the time, Callie, were critical witnesses in a murder case that put this serial killer into prison and onto death row. And some stuff is happening present day that is making them question if they got it right. And there are appeals happening in his case and this case is back in the news. And Callie and Tessa are starting to question if what they saw back in the day and who they saw back in the day is actually the person that's in jail. And Tessa has had left the town where they were. She went to move in with her grandmother. Her mom sort of just ran off. Her dad was in prison and her dad has just died in prison, which is why Tessa has come back to this town. And his death not only kind of brings up all these 
horrible memories and unanswered questions, but it also forces her to confront a whole bunch of stuff that she left behind years ago. And we have kind of this dark and messed up story from the past and this dark and messed up story in the present. And Tessa is trying to just come to terms with what happened then. She's trying to come to terms with her family. Like her mother abandoned her again. Her dad's in prison. Her sister, who was, I want to say like seven or eight years older than her at the time. She was a teenager. Also left home not long afterwards. So Tess has basically just been orphaned by her family. And she is just lost and untethered and she's not doing all that well. And she gets back to this town and it just, it's like an avalanche of things from the past and things from the present. So I was totally in it for, did they convict the wrong person? Let's revisit the mystery from the past. You know, they were like children at the time. They were like, eight years old at the time. I mean, were they bullied into it by the police? You know, what kind of evidence was there? What questions went unanswered? Were they just looking for someone they could put in jail to help explain these serial killings that were happening? And I was totally there for it. But then there was like all this other stuff that was going on. And I just found like it, it got us like off the path and off the target. And it was a little bit too much meandering. And I didn't love Callie and it seemed like there was some opportunity for some good things to happen and there were some good characters that I thought could have been better but I just ultimately didn't love it so I'm glad I read it I'm getting it off the shelf and it wasn't all bad but it just wasn't wasn't great I'm not gonna read it again so I would say it's just fine it's like a three it's like an even Steven middle of the road it just wasn't as dark as I thought. And I read so many good reviews on Goodreads about it from people that I agree with on a lot of things. It just wasn't as dark and messed up as I wanted it to be. So I might say more about me than it says about the book. I've read better. I've totally read better. So next up, I read slash listened to my first Patricia Highsmith and I listened to Strangers on a Train. And I am on this mission to read all of the mysteries that are spoiled in Peter Swanson's Eight Perfect Murders before I read Eight Perfect Murders, and this is one of them. So I knew kind of the core story of Strangers on the Train, but much like Rebecca, I had managed to not be spoiled for the ending of this book, thank goodness, and it was, it was dark and messed up. It really was. And this is, I wanna say it came out in 1950, so Hitchcock made a movie of it which just showed up on Turner Classic Movies and I recorded it, but I haven't watched it yet and I'm very excited to see it. I know they made a couple, actually I shouldn't say, I don't know if they made changes to this. They made changes to Rebecca that Hitchcock also made, but let's bring back Strangers on a Train. So in this one we have, as the title tells you, two strangers who meet on a train. So Guy is this super successful architect and he's in the midst of a divorce he has a new lady, as apparently one is apt to do, and he just wants to divorce his wife, who also happens to be pregnant, but she was also involved with somebody else, so it's kind of messed up. And Guy meets Bruno on the train, and Bruno is from New York. He's going to, I want to say like New Mexico or something. Guy is going to Texas, and they wind up kind of just sharing some drinks, having dinner, and Guy gets a little too liquored up and he starts kind of like talking about the ex or talking about his wife and all the problems and how he wants to get divorced. And Bruno's like, well, I hate my dad. You know what we could do? I could get rid of your problem and you could get rid of my problem. And he kind of proposes that they just kill each other's problems. And it would be totally clean because no one would suspect them because they have no connection to each other. They randomly met on this train. No one's seen them together, right? No problem. Well, as you can guess, problems abound. And Bruno is a bit of, um, of a psychopath and kind of a manipulative, awful human being. And even though Guy gets off the train and he's like, later Gator, Bruno somehow still manages to insert himself into Guy's life and mess it up royally. So this is again, definitely dark and messed up people doing dark and messed up things. And it was way darker than I thought it was going to be. I wasn't quite sure where things were gonna go. And it, yeah, it went places I didn't expect. And 
I haven't read Tom Ripley yet, but I have it up there. If you guys follow me, you know, I've seen the movie. And I know that Patricia Highsmith can go places and she totally does. And I was hooked. For one, the audiobook is really good. So Bronson Pinchot from, anybody remembers that TV show, Perfect Strangers? I know he's done other things, but like Balky on Perfect Strangers to me, I feel like is just, that's what people are always gonna remember him for. He does the narration on it and he's really good. Listening to it and I feel like, cause I knew part of what like the core story was, but then I was like, are we really? Is this really gonna happen? And then it was done. And then I was like, okay, yeah, uh-huh. I need to back up. I need to think about this. And like the more I thought about it, and I feel like I had a very similar, even though while I was reading Rebecca, I was enjoying it. Thinking about these books that were written so long ago that I feel like totally stand the test of time. And I don't know why I'm thinking like that people couldn't write dark and messed up books back in the day, because obviously they did. I'm having like this whole new appreciation for classic books. And I went on a Turner Classic Movie Rampage. I'm not even kidding. I have like nine movies recorded, including Psycho and Rear Window. I've seen Rear Window. Dial in for Murder, which I've seen, but not in a hundred years. Strangers on a Train. I was like, how many dark and messed up movies can I gather? And I'm totally here for it. So I'm enjoying this like noir, kind of classic where it all began kind of feel. But I really enjoyed Strangers on a Train. Is it the most perfect murder? I don't know. But they actually say in this book, this is the perfect murder. So time will tell. But I'm enjoying going down the rabbit hole of reading these books before I read Eight Perfect Murders. And it was good. If you haven't read it, if you haven't listened to it, if you haven't read Patricia Highsmith, I would totally give it a go. As a huge thriller fan and as someone who's writing a book, it feels like such an education to read these books on top of everything else, but I had a good time with it. So thumbs up for me on this one. So that's everything I finished in April. I am reading a craft book, Save the Cat, which I've talked to you guys about before, I'm sure. And I'm still reading Gabrielle Bernstein's The Universe Has Your Back. That's like a self-help with kind of like activities and things in it. So that's kind of a slow read that I'm dipping in and out of. But these are the books that I finished in April and I had a really good month and I'm already off to a good start for May too. So let me know what you guys have read in April. Favorite book, if you've read any of these books. You know the drill, thoughts, feelings, all the things. But I hope you guys are doing really well. I hope this finds you doing well and hopefully having a less frenetic month than I was having. And I'm gonna do my best to film some videos to get more content out to you guys. So thanks for being patient with my ups and downs and for being here and for watching. So take care you guys and I'll see you soon. Bye everybody.